Hello and welcome to this video about the famous fundamental theorem of calculus. Here I want to tell you how we can naturally extend the statement of the theorem to a larger class of functions. You might already know that we have proven this fundamental theorem of calculus in my real analysis course for continuously differentiable functions. If not, please check out part 55 of that series. And now it turns out that we can definitely weaken the assumptions of the theorem and that's exactly what we will do today. However, before we start with the details, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And please don't forget, as a supporter you can download a lot of additional material like the book for real analysis or all PDF versions for the videos. So if you are interested in these, please check out the link in the description. Okay, then without further ado, let's start with the statement of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And there, as already mentioned, what we need for the assumption is a continuously differentiable function f defined on a compact interval a, b. And this simply means that our function f is differentiable at every point in the interval and this derivative that comes out is a continuous function on the interval again. So in particular, we can write f prime of x for every x in the interval. And since this is a continuous function, the integral from a to b definitely makes sense as well. And now the statement of the fundamental theorem of calculus is exactly that this integral can be calculated with an antiderivative of this integrand inside. Hence our function f does the job, we just have to evaluate it at b and a. More precisely, we need the difference of both values to get the value of the integral. So roughly speaking, you could say that the integral and the derivative cancel each other. And exactly this connection between integration and differentiation makes it the fundamental theorem. And moreover, as you might know, the common approach for calculus or real analysis would be to use the Riemann integral first. However, then one can generalize the whole process of integration and gets the so-called Lebesgue integral. Indeed, it turns out that the Lebesgue integral is much more suited for a whole theory of integrable functions. In addition, it's also more general than the Riemann integral, which means whenever the Riemann integral exists, it's equal to the corresponding Lebesgue integral. In other words, the fundamental theorem of calculus is correct no matter which integral version you use. However, the Lebesgue integral is definitely helpful if we want to weaken the assumptions of the theorem. Namely, we don't need a continuous function inside the integral such that the integral exists and we already know that from the Riemann integral as well. Moreover, the derivative f prime does not even have to exist for all points x in the interval. Indeed, for example, you know that the integral does not care at all if you change the function inside at finitely many points. Therefore, the minimal requirement we have for the left hand side is that this function f prime is integrable. Therefore, we could just say that the derivative has to exist almost everywhere. Now, if you don't know this term, I can quickly explain it, but it's a little bit technical. It tells you that you can look at the set where the function f prime is not defined. This means the points where the derivative as a limit process does not exist. And then if we measure this set with respect to the standard Lebesgue measure in R, we get out zero. So for example, every finite or even countable set has Lebesgue measure zero. Okay, so this is definitely our first requirement. Without that, we cannot formulate the fundamental theorem of calculus. And now I can already tell you, it's not enough to get the theorem out. To see that, let's immediately look at an example. And there we can keep it simple. Let's take a non-continuous function with a jump. So let's say we are at the value zero until we reach the point one, and then we jump to the value one. So it's not complicated at all, just a piecewise constant function. And therefore obviously the derivative exists almost everywhere. The only exception point we have is where we jump up. So it's not a differentiable function, but f prime of x still makes sense whenever x is not equal to 1. 
And this is good enough for us if f prime is inside the integral anyway. In fact, for this function f, we now can check both sides of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And there the left hand side is really simple, because we just integrate the zero function. So the integral is definitely zero, which is not equal to the right hand side, because there we get out one. Hence, for this function f, the fundamental theorem of calculus is not satisfied. So we definitely cannot extend the theorem to non-continuous functions. However, as it turns out, even continuous functions are still not good enough. Indeed, we can tweak the example above such that we have a continuous function that still has some jumps in between. Of course, these are not discrete jumps as before, because everything has to work in a continuous way. So what we get is a function that is still mostly constant. However, we can construct the function in such a way that in between these constant parts get smaller and smaller. Obviously, we need to do a limit process in the end, and the result we get is called the Cantor function. So I don't want to explain the explicit construction, but the important result we get. Namely, it's a continuous function, which is also monotonically increasing, where at some parts it can be constant. And indeed, this implies, and this is really important for us, that it is almost everywhere differentiable. And as in the example before, the derivative is equal to zero almost everywhere. And now you see, despite these two properties, the function can still increase from zero to one. And therefore the calculation for the fundamental theorem of calculus is exactly the same as before. And with that we get the important result that continuity together with differentiability almost everywhere is not enough to satisfy the fundamental theorem of calculus. So we definitely need more, for example, a continuity property for f prime. And at this point we can show that a piecewise continuity is already enough. This means it's not needed that f is continuously differentiable, but at least piecewise continuously differentiable. And there you might know that the piecewise property always means that we can split up our interval into finitely many subintervals. So in between the point A on the left hand side and the point B on the right hand side, we can find finitely many points. And let's call them A1, A2, and so on. And let's say we take m intermediate points, so the last one is AM. And now in order to make a nice continuation, let's say the first one, A0, is given as A. And in a similar way, let's say the last one, AM plus 1, is equal to B. Of course, the names don't matter so much, the important thing is that we have finitely many intervals. And then we can just restrict our function f to each interval. And each interval can be written as aj to aj plus 1. And now we want that each restriction is an ordinary continuously differentiable function. So the whole thing is not complicated at all, it just means that we can split up the function into nice functions again. Or from another point of view, you can say we take continuously differentiable functions and glue them together. So for example, the graph could look like this. We have a function there, then comes this function, this function. So we can have these corners, but only finitely many. And exactly at these corners, we would put our intermediate points a1, a2, and so on. Okay, and now the claim is that the fundamental theorem of calculus still holds in this case. Indeed, there we don't have any problem of defining the left-hand side, because only finitely many points are undefined for the derivative. And moreover, this already gives us the idea for the proof, because we just apply our original fundamental theorem finitely many times. So let's simply do that. This means our whole integral from a to b can be written as a sum over the subintervals. In other words, we just have the sum from j is equal to 0 to m, and then the integral inside goes from aj to aj plus 1. And since inside this interval our function is continuously differentiable, we have the fundamental theorem of calculus. Therefore what we get is f of aj plus 1 minus f of aj. And here you should not forget that f is a continuous function, 
So the value at aj is well defined. And then what we get here is a nice telescoping sum where only the first and the last entry remain. So we get am plus 1 and a0 which is simply b and a again. And there we have it, this is the proof of the extension of the fundamental theorem of calculus. But this is not the end of the story, because we can expand this nice theorem even more. Of course, in a lot of applications we have such a piecewise continuously differentiable function, so for those applications this statement, this formulation here is good enough. But from a mathematical point of view, we definitely want to answer the question how much we can weaken the assumptions. Hence, this will be the maximal extension of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And this one we can simply formulate as an equivalence for a given function f. Hence, if we assume that the integral of f prime from a to an endpoint c exists, and moreover, it should be equal to f of c minus f of a for every c in the interval a, b, then we would say that the fundamental theorem of calculus is satisfied for f. So you see, we have to assume that it works no matter how small we choose the interval for the integration. Because it could definitely happen that the equation is satisfied for one particular point, but not for any other. Ok, and now the conclusion is that f has to be an absolutely continuous function. And there I can tell you, this is more than just a continuous function, but less than a continuously differentiable function. However, the explicit definition of this term is definitely something for another video. For this video here, we have the result that we have the equivalence. Therefore, you should also remember, every absolutely continuous function satisfies the fundamental theorem of calculus. And indeed, now we know these are exactly the functions that satisfy the general theorem. So in particular, this Cantor function from above is a continuous function, but not an absolutely continuous function. Ok, with that I would say, I hope we meet in the next video again, where we talk about the definition of absolutely continuous functions. So have a nice day and bye bye!